Today, let's take a look at some of the scariest found footage of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Viewer discretion is advised. Starting off this countdown, we have the haunted house. In this clip, the Warrens talk about a haunted house that they visited and the creepy things they encountered while they were there. According to them, someone in the house used an Ouija board and it opened up a bunch of doors to the spirit world. And that's how it got haunted. There had been doors open through Ouija that's boards. That's what I was wondering. But unlike most times, we do not condone the use of Ouija boards. We know that people fooling with Ouija boards open doors that can never be closed. Well. Guess who was using that Ouija board? Then there was a boy, and the boy was eight years old. Now that girl was coming over to care for that boy, and he was in like a, I don't know what you'd call it, it's a canning area now, like a canning closet. Like a coal cellar. Oh. Like a coal well, cellar. Up. And the boy had communicated on the Ouija board with them regarding what he witnessed. So the young boy and his babysitter were using the Ouija board in the cold cellar and let some spirits into their home. So apparently back in the day, three women used to live in that house and their mother. While they were living there, they were actually haunted by a ghost that was killed in their home back in the day. They would see apparitions of this young girl smiling. And at first the mom would just see the ghost, but then all the other women started seeing the ghost as well. And in one case, she actually spoke to her. I believe there was a conversation between mm -hmm. them. There was a conversation between the two of them and then this dark form who we believe to be the person who had perpetrated oh, man. This, of this man and the girl ran and hid. That's when they learned that the house was actually haunted by a little girl that was killed there and her murderer. The Ouija board had opened up the door to the spirit realm and those spirits had actually come back into the house and are haunting it. Here is an image that the Warrens took while they were on the property. Well that's the electromagnetic energy that a spirit will gather to manifest itself. And what it's creating here is what we call a psychic light rod. The ghost also manifested itself into orbs as well. Moving on to number nine, we have the Amityville haunting. Now, this is probably the most controversial paranormal case of all time. On November 13th of 1974, Robert Butch Defoe took the lives of his parents and his two brothers and two sisters. The house was then put up for sale and the Lutz family moved in. And apparently the demon that got Butch to do the horrific deeds started to attack their family as well. The doors would open and close by themselves, green slime would ooze from their walls, and one time a demonic face with red glowing eyes was seen looking into their house. So on and so on. You've probably heard of this house. The Warrens went to investigate and confirm that the house was haunted. And now I'm pretty sure you've seen this viral photo of what appears to be a ghost boy peering out of the corner. Well, here's what the Warrens had to say about this photo. It's in the upstairs bedrooms, just to the left there, you see what looks like a small boy's face looking out with bioluminescent eyes. This was the room of one of the young boys who was murdered there. Isn't that eerie? Now, a lot of people would say, well, is that the spirit of the young boy? No, it is not the spirit of the young boy but is a diabolical spirit. That photo had always given me the creeps and I didn't know it was an evil spirit. I thought it was like an innocent ghost boy. You think that is an evil spirit, Ed? Positively. Everything about this house was evil. Again, this case is controversial because a lot of people think that the family just made up the haunting to get rich and the Warrens went along with it. But I don't know, man, I don't know. In at number eight, we have the ghost in the cathedral. This is apparently another real life ghost that the Warrens managed to capture on camera. If you look at this slide now, I want you to see, no, no don't no, point it no, out no. to them. Don't do that. Let them see where the man is. There's a yeah. man, he's right there in that picture. Here's a close up if you didn't manage to spot it. Go to the next one. There, there he is. is. See right in the oh, corner yeah. and you see him and that's in the cathedral. I clearly saw a man in a suit. Hopefully y'all saw it too. Let me know. Smash that like button if you did. So according to the Warrens, tragedy took place in the church and now a number of spirits haunt the church. They didn't go into great detail, but back in the day, people actually got burned alive in that church for being part of different Scottish clans and now their souls haunt it. But in that church about 200 years ago, there was over 100 people burnt to death. They were all herded in there like cattle and burnt to death. Moving on to number seven, we have the family in Connecticut. So basically, Ed and Lorraine Warren went to Connecticut to help a family that was being severely haunted. What I'm about to show you is real footage from this case. Basically, it starts with Ed and Lorraine sitting at a table praying with the family, and then Ed tries to make contact with whatever is haunting their house. One knock for yes, two for no. Are you a man? 
Are you a boy? You want the people in this house to move? One knock for yes, two for no. Yes. Okay. Using the one knock for yes and two knock for no method, Ed was actually able to find out more about this ghost that was haunting them. So the ghost was haunting their home and causing a scene because it didn't like the family's mother. Who is it that you don't like the most here? Is it Is it their father? Is it their mother? Oh my god. Okay. Isn't that creepy? But also, it's not the only ghostly thing that they caught on camera. Later on, Ed asks the ghost to give them a sign, and the kitchen chair moves back on its own. Give me some sign. Is that you moving something? Give me some sign that you're here. And at number six, we have Annabelle the doll, which she gives me the heebie-jeebies, people. In this next interview with Ed and Lorraine Warren, they talk all about Annabelle the doll. One of the most famous would be Annabelle. Mm -hmm. This is a Raggedy Ann doll that's made like thousands of other dolls, except that this doll was used in communication, almost like having a seance. Mm -hmm. So story goes that a young nurse received the doll as a gift from her mother. She lived with a fellow nurse. The two worked together and they also lived together. Well, one morning the nurse brought the doll down and put it at the kitchen table to have breakfast with. It was meant as a joke. She's like, ah, ha ha, look, this doll is having breakfast with us. But the next day she did the exact same thing. She brought the doll down and she sat it down for breakfast. The next day she did the exact same thing and it kept happening. And then something even more terrifying happened. But the third morning, they're talking to the doll and the arms of the doll are on the chair like this. Suddenly they went up and onto the table. Now this didn't frighten them. And that was their first mistake. So they did end up taking it to a medium and the medium informed them that the spirit of a six year old girl who had died in a car accident on the road by their house was latched onto the doll. They did some research and they did find out that a little girl named Annabelle had died on the road in a car crash right by their house. But listen to what Ed says here. There was a six year old child by the name of Annabelle who was killed, but God does not allow the spirit of a child to go into a doll. This was a demon who was posing as that little child to create sympathy to these two young women. It worked and this demon tricked the girls. They ended up looking after this doll thinking it was Annabelle the little girl. They would take it out on excursions, buy it clothes, jewelry, and then it started to attack the girls. The scariest thing happened when the two nurses came back from their shift one night. They'd leave the doll in the bedroom. They'd come home after midnight Put the key in the door, unlock the door, and who do you think is standing there? The Raggedy Ann doll. Standing there. Hearing Ed say that literally sent shivers down my spine. Just imagine coming home and seeing that doll standing there perfectly upright. Mm. The doll later on went to attack one of the nurse's boyfriends by choking him out in his sleep. Finally, Ed and Lorraine Warren got involved and ended up taking the doll from them and locking it away in a museum. So yes, Annabelle is real and terrifying. Next up we have the Warren's Museum. The Warren's Museum is filled with cursed and deadly objects that literally if you touch them or do something wrong they could possess you or kill you. And in this video you'll see just how terrifying their museum truly is. Let's take a look at the shadow doll or the doll of shadows. There are many uh, what we call death dolls here. The doll you see here was made through black magic rituals. It's called doll of shadows. This doll is absolutely terrifying. Like if you thought Annabelle was bad, this doll is 10 times worse. It has uh, human bones here and there and animal uh, parts all over the body. So yes, the doll is composed of human bones and hair and teeth. The owner was using it for dark rituals and in the end the doll became possessed by a very powerful and malevolent demon. In fact, the way in which this doll was used is absolutely horrifying. They take a picture of this doll, they send it to you and they put the curse on the back. You take it and you look at it and you laugh at it, but it's not a laughing matter. Because once you see the image of the doll, it can be projected telepathically to you in your dream state. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? That is terrifying. But that's not all. Apparently this doll killed a number of people in their sleep. Uh, images of these dolls can be so frightening that they've actually stopped people's hearts during the dream state. Ed then goes on to talk about how this doll ended up getting possessed in the first place. So a couple ended up getting it for sale at an antique shop. The antique dealer practically gave it to them. They're like, take it from me. 
That's a red flag. Then they started having horrifying nightmares. Then they found out that the nightmares they were having were the exact same. And then one night, the husband woke up and had huge gash marks on his back. The scariest part is that the doll can never be destroyed. You see, you must be very careful with a doll like this. You can never destroy it. If you destroy it, you could have things occur to you that would be horrible. Because the spirits that are within the doll Freed. And in our last spot today, we have the real life vampires. According to Ed and Lorraine Warren, vampires are real, but they aren't like typical vampires that you see in movies, like I want to suck your blood, and they wear like a cape and stuff. No, no. Are there such a thing as vampires, and can you tell me an example of one? Positively, uh, vampires do exist, what we call human vampires. They talk about two different types of vampires that are out there. The first being someone that hallucinates and imagines themselves as a vampire and takes on that role. The other is demonstrated by the Albany case from 1953. Back in 1953, in Old Greenwich Farm Cemetery, where the Calvani family had to open up a grave mm -hmm. and uh, they, uh, a family member had died and they were saving a little money by digging the grave themselves. Mm -hmm. When they got down about four foot, they struck a coffin which shouldn't be there. It was their private plot. He goes on to say that the coffin was of an antique nature. They opened it up and there was a perfectly preserved man in there. And inside was a man about 45 years old and he was fresh to the touch as though he had just been buried. So even though the plot was there, there's a law that you can't exhume the body until you get a court order. So this process took about a week. And when they got back to the grave site, both the coffin and the body were badly deteriorated. This freaked everyone out. People went wild and they were like, oh my God, it's a vampire, ah! And they were right. According to the Warrens, the man in the coffin was a sorcerer and user of black magic. He had put himself in a catatonic state. He was alive, but just barely. And then at night, he would leave the coffin with his astral body and find his prey. His astral body was being connected to his physical body by something Ed referred to as silver cord. So no matter how far he went, he could still make it back to his body. While the physical body is still alive, there is a silver cord, a supernatural cord, that emanates from the physical body to the astral body. Mm -hmm. No matter how far away that astral body goes, if you go 3,000 miles, that cord would still be attached. So somehow that cord got broken, maybe when the woman got the land consecrated. And that's why when they went back to the coffin, the body was gone and there was just bones. Now you're not gonna believe this next part. I don't even know if I do. So this vampire dude didn't arise from his tomb and go around biting people's neck to suck their blood. No, no. And he would go in search of blood, but he would not bite into anybody's neck. He could take the blood through what we call teleportation, apports. So vampires could literally be real and among us. I don't know, okay? I really don't know. Of the dark entity. So it all began when a couple started to experience really dark paranormal activity in their house. They heard all kinds of strange sounds and footsteps and Mm -hmm. They'd hear banging, knocking. So they decided to contact the Warrens for help to expel this evil spirit out. When the Warrens investigated their property, they said that it was a very bad infestation. Here is the ghost that they managed to capture on camera. And this picture that you're going to look at right now, here's their ghost. That was taken. Just to the right there. In, to the right. Above the chair, right? Right above the chair. Right. Now, this is in the lowest level of that property. So this was taken in the basement of the house and you can clearly see the outline of a ghostly person standing there. Now this ghost was not happy with the couple that was living there, obviously. The Warrens theorized that this is because for years the property was owned by one family that actually built the house originally. So imagine moving into a house that was owned by one family blood for so long and then you come along totally not related and the family members are like, who the hell are you? Get out. The owners had been there for years and built the house. Oh. So the vibrations were really built up from hmm. that, that family that preceded them. Moving on down, we have the Providence Ghost Man. The next ghost that they're talking about is the ghost of a World War II soldier. Now, the story is actually very sad and pretty creepy. There was once a house, and in that house lived a couple during World War II. His wife was informed that he was killed in action, not yeah. even missing, that he was actually killed in action. And then a week later, she committed suicide. That is absolutely heartbreaking. So the wife was informed that her husband was dead and she couldn't bear to live without him, so she took her own life. And one week after that, 
He was found alive. And then they're like, oops, sorry, he's actually alive. My bad. Some like Romeo and Juliet type shit, you know? Now it's said that both of the ghosts are attached to that home and no one has ever moved in since. Here is an image of what is said to be the ghost of the husband. Now that looks like uh, a man. Yes. But we have other photographs which look like a woman. Yes, we do. So where you have one spirit, you have, you have many more other spirits. than one. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, you know, at least they found their way back to each other in the afterlife, you know? In our next spot today, we have the possessed woman. The footage I'm about to share with you is of a real possessed woman going through a real exorcism. No, no, no. The exorcism footage is an hour and 20 minutes long, but the footage was actually cut down. So that means that they were performing this exorcism for over an hour. I will say though that the footage is blurred to censor some graphic images, but also for the privacy of the woman. Tell me your name, devil. Uh, woman, here you are. What keeps you here? Mark! In the name of God, answer my question. Ah, Mark! Even though it's blurred, you can still see how the woman is acting and hear the weird noises that she's making. We take fully of it. We bring him to him with scripture. We take victim, resolve it, divorce it, cure it, or ripple it. We take creation and kept sunny broth, destroy Ori. We be TV, from an extra to it, Eric, paper artist, and country. You can see the woman trying to fight back against the demon that is possessing her. And she's crying out in pain from having the demon fighting to stay in her body. So in the footage, Tony Spira is actually holding down the woman so that, you know, she doesn't lash out and attack people. She can't speak, but she is still trying to do so. But all that's coming coming out of her mouth are gasps for air. At one point she points beyond the camera and Tony knew that the demon was in the room with them and was situated right where the woman was pointing. It gets creepier when everyone in the room starts chanting along trying to get the demon out of her. It's scary, but it's also really sad. Like this woman is going through so much pain and suffering. And again, we don't know if this exorcism was successful. Up next, we have the White Lady of Union. So according to the Warrens, there's a lady dressed in white that haunts the Union Cemetery in Easton, Connecticut. So they gave her the name, the White Lady of Union. She was apparently the victim of betrayal by her lover and died either by taking her own life or that she was actually killed by her lover. Well, Ed was very very determined to capture her on tape. So in the summer of 1990, Ed apparently camped out in the cemetery for a week trying to make contact with this ghost. Here is that footage. 1760. At first, it's just classic footage of the cemetery during the day, and then it cuts to nighttime and things get spooky. You see in the distance the lady dressed in white walking towards the camera, and then she sort of disappears into the darkness. <laughs> I mean, it's not the best footage there is out there, but this was huge for the Warrens, especially because so many people thought it just to be an urban legend, and then here are the Warrens getting it on tape and then proving that it's real. In our third spot today, we have the Anna Eklund case. In this next video, we see Ed and Lorraine Warren talking about Anna Eklund. Anna Eklund was an American woman who in 1928 became possessed and underwent a number of exorcisms. During her exorcisms, things would happen like she would hiss or howl like an animal. She would float in the air, and whenever holy water touched her skin, it would burn her skin right off. So let's see what Ed and Lorraine Warren had to say about this case. Now this woman was under possession by her own father and devils from the age of 14. The father hated her. He hated her so much that when he died, he actually possessed her with these devils. Now this case is very dark. 
So sadly, her father was taking advantage of her on multiple occasions, and when she, you know, refused, the father was not happy, which made him mad and made him start to resent her. This poor woman was tormented right up to the age of 54 when Father Ressinger went to help her. So Anna underwent 30 exorcisms and none of them were successful. That's when they decided to send her to St. Joseph's Church in Iowa to see if they could get the demons out of her. When she was arrived, she was placed on a cot right in front of a group of nuns. And the nuns were all stationed around this woman on a cot. Suddenly, a loud bellowing hoarse voice came out of the woman. Filthy obscenities came from the woman's mouth. And she rose into the air and went up to the ceiling and clung to the ceiling by her hands and feet. That's literally like a scene from The Exorcist. After that, she had to be tied down on the cot, but that's not even the worst part. And the nuns constantly were throwing holy water at her. This woman, at ports of what looked like spaghetti and human hair, came out of her mouth. Barrels of it. I'm talking barrels. I'm not talking plateful or something. Barrels of it. Yeah, that's a little repulsive, and apparently she would throw up 20 to 30 times a day. Not only that, but it stunk so bad that the nuns had to take 15 minute shifts with her, or else they would fall ill. Imagine how horrific this scene must have been them performing exorcisms on Anna. In our second spot today, we have the haunted bed and breakfast. So this clip features a woman named Addie who shares her story of living in a haunted house that she was in for 15 years. Now you might be thinking, why would she put up 15 years of hauntings? No, don't worry, she didn't. First of all, when she moved in, she didn't even know the house was haunted and the hauntings didn't even begin until one random day. And obviously when spooky things started to happen, she contacted the Warrens. Now the home was converted into a bed and breakfast, and when paranormal stuff began to happen, the guests started noticing as well. That time, Addie was running it as a bed and breakfast and told us about things that were occurring, not just to her, her two children, and her husband, but also to people who would be guests in the home. They would hear the knocking, they would hear the rapping, they would hear the footsteps in the home. Now the home was very old. It was built in 1809, meaning there have been tons of people that have come and gone to that house throughout the years. But trouble only began happening when Addie started to renovate the house. When you start to do things where you're making renovations in a home, that that is enough to trigger off spirit sure. phenomena, mm -hmm. where a ghost had once been able to walk through a doorway in a certain area, and now that doorway no longer exists. And with Addie, many changes had taken place in this home. So Addie basically pissed off the spirits and made them active. Nice one. Now, Addie says a lot about the house. When we were looking at the house with the real estate agent, we noticed that there were two staircases and one of the doorways leading up to the front staircase had been nailed shut. And no one had lived on the second floor for 30 years. That's not good. One of the windows of the bedroom was broken and vines had grown in through the window and all throughout the whole bedroom. So nobody ever went up there. No one wanted to live there because it was so haunted on that floor. In fact, in 1955, there was a great flood and it left a number of people homeless. So the people that actually owned the house at the time took in 40 flood victims and was like, you can stay with us on the second floor, the haunted floor. After a week, they all fled. These people had no place to go. And after a week, they came downstairs. They all left. They fled. They said there was something on the second floor that didn't want them up there. Which is insane because, you know, they needed a place to stay, but they're like, no, I'd rather be homeless than to stay in that haunted house. Now here's one really creepy paranormal encounter that Addie had in the house. We moved into the house and we had a big argument. I told him, I said, stop leaving the doors open. and letting the dogs out. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm not leaving the doors open. He said, you're leaving the doors open. Oh. And this argument went back and forth and then he pointed to the back door. He said, I can lock this door, turn my back on it in this room, then turn around and this door's open. And so that night we went around and we locked up every window, every door in the house. And as we went to bed, my husband said, I feel that we're locking something in with us. We're not locking something out. And then that morning we got up and we came downstairs. Every door was open. That is terrifying. And there's so much more information that Addie actually talks about. So if you want to see another part to this video, then I will talk about Addie's story again and show you more footage of her talking about this really creepy and crazy haunted bed and breakfast. And in our number one spot today, we have Maurice Thoreau. I have talked about this dude before 
or if you have seen my video on the real life possessions caught on camera, you would know that he's featured. And this is one of the scariest piece of footage that there is out there of a possession. So if you've seen The Nun, it's based on the real story of Maurice. So it occurred in 1985 and he actually got possessed. Sometimes blood would randomly pour out of his body from his nose, eyes, or mouth, and he didn't know what was causing it. And then he developed super strength randomly. And then he could also understand and speak Latin. Yeah, that's like a, you know you're possessed when that happens. So at first he went to the police for help and they're like, mm -mm, we can't deal with you. And then obviously the Warrens were called. So he went through a number of exorcisms and here is footage of just one of them. So the footage starts with Ed asking Frenchie to lift up his shirt because apparently random crosses would show up engraved in his skin. Point it out to me, Maurice. I want to make sure I have the right one. Right there. And those would appear all over his body randomly. Now, in this footage, you can see a number of other creepy things happening to him during the exorcism. You could see him drooling from his mouth, but as soon as the drool hits his shirt, it turns to blood. <laughs> And then at one point, we see Frenchie's face become incredibly still and his face changes completely. Like he doesn't look like his self. His eyes get very glassy and creepy looking. <laughs> And then at one point we see a cut randomly form on his forehead and it just starts bleeding. Like how is this happening? Because there is some evil spirit inside of him trying to stay in them while the Warrens are trying to expel it out. Scotland's underground city. In 1996, Ed and Lorraine Warren visited Edinburgh in Scottsdale to investigate an underground city that was said to be haunted. In this video, you see an older tour guide talking about the underground city and teaching Lorraine about the history. Right, now this, this is one of the shops. The close run from the high street right down there. All down the right hand side, there were shops and businesses. This is one of them. This was a wine shop. There used to be underground shops there and stuff. And at one point he talked about getting bad vibes from being down there. And apparently Lorraine was sensing this as well. That's funny, you get the funny feeling. Mm, I got funny feeling, all right. A very bad feeling. It gets worse when he talks about how everyone died down there and there were just piles of bodies being there because no one could get rid of them. And every day the close here started to die off with the plague, one by one. As they died off, they were just carried from them houses here, up to the top of the coast where the high street is, and dumped on a car and taken away to the plate pits. Which is probably why the place is haunted. I mean, so many people die down there and their spirits are trapped down there because they didn't get a proper burial. Well, at one point in the video, Lorraine claims that she hears the ghost walking by. She then started to feel another presence was there. It feels like somebody is like squeezing your insides all together actually squeezing the life right out of you it just blows my mind how calm she is when she's fully like yep there's a ghost with us right now oh yeah i just heard a ghost oh yeah a ghost just walked by like what Lorraine! <laughs> in our next spot, we have the photographic evidence of ghosts. In this footage, you see Ed and Lorraine Warren discussing a number of cases where they caught photographic evidence of ghosts. The first case that they talk about revolves a woman named Gail Martin. Basically, Gail moved into a house and for the longest time, nothing spooky happened. Then one day, she was digging in her backyard when she was gardening. Her husband took a photo of her doing so, and when it developed, you could see a white silhouette of a ghost. Now, you see that Gail is higher than that woman. Gail is, is on a pile of dirt. Mm -hmm. She's up, and she is digging, 
and the woman is looking down at her. Then we have a second photo taken of Gail that same day. And then again, you could see a ghost in the shot. That, that was taken just moments after the first one. And Gail is smiling because her husband is saying something funny. The woman is smiling and she puts her hand up to her mouth in that manner. These are two exceptionally remarkable sight And she looks like an elderly woman who would dress that way. They used to put the uh, house coats house over their dressing gown, yeah. yes. Now, unfortunately, since it is old footage, it's super hard to see clearly in the photo. Now, Lorraine actually made contact with this ghost, and that's when we learned more about her story. The house that Gail is living in, we believe, is the house that that woman built for her son, who was a doctor, for him to use as a piece of summer property to get away from his hectic practice in New York. According to Lorraine, the woman in the photograph once had a child who she loved. She even built a place for him on her property for him to stay, so he was always close to her. And she idolized mm. this man, it was her only child. That summer, he was working at a children's camp and he contracted polio. So this one summer, during the polio epidemic, he <clears throat> was at a children's camp when he contacted polio and died three days later. It was during the midst of the polio epidemic. Three days later, he sadly passed away. The mother was extremely heartbroken. You can imagine how tragic that had to be for his mother. And that in itself, tragedies create the ghost syndrome. So when she passed away, she attached herself to the piece of land. And that in itself, would cause her to remain there, but she probably didn't show herself. So if you had to guess, Lorraine, you would, you would guess that that is the mother of that doctor? Yes, yes. When Gail started gardening, you know, it disrupted some things, and that's when the ghost made herself seen. Moving on down, we have the Buddhist exorcism. In the early 2000s, the Warrens took a trip to Japan to check out some haunted tunnels. Apparently, a number of people died in these tunnels, so they were sent to go check them out. But while they were there, they were actually contacted to perform an exorcism as well. This was on a woman named Teresa. Now, this footage is very creepy because not only is it footage of a woman that is possessed, but because you can actually, like, hear the demon in her voice. Teresa, you hear me? Teresa, you hear me? You understand me? Teresa, leave. Leave, Teresa. Lorraine is, you know, talking to Teresa, telling her to fight back against the demon that's inside of her, controlling her. Leave, dear, leave. I'm here to help you. Things take a turn when Teresa starts speaking in English to Lorraine. Teresa doesn't speak English. She's talking English, Ed. Yes. See, your mother, go with your mother, she be Teresa. Happy go with your mother. Go with your mother. Go with your mother. So clearly, this was the demon communicating with Lorraine. Towards the end of the exorcism, Teresa starts lashing out towards Lorraine and others. She is crawling around, growling like a demon, and talking in a raspy voice. The footage ends with Lorraine once again telling Teresa to fight back against the demon. We don't know if this exorcism was actually successful, but I don't think it was. Next, we have the cursed objects. Now let's head on down to the Warren's Occult Museum, shall we? In this interview, Ed is seen talking about how dangerous their museum actually is. It shouldn't be a museum, actually. Not gonna lie. The most haunted area in the world, that's what I would say. I would say that it is one of the most wanted areas because of the many things here, Tony. These are all things that you then would consider evil, Ed? Oh, positively. He also tells stories of people that have died or have been severely injured after fooling around in their museum. Again, shouldn't be a museum then, open to the public. In fact, this is not a building that you should be in after 9 o'clock at night. 
Mm -hmm. uh, from nine to six are the psychic hours. Many of the objects in this room here have had dire effects on people. People have been maimed, have been killed. People have wound up in mental institutions because of many of the things they write in this building here. Now the Warrens had a strict set of rules. They told visitors not to touch anything whatsoever. This is because their aura then mingles with the object's aura and it can easily latch onto you. If anybody touches anything in this room, their aura mingles with the aura of that object, mm -hmm. which is very evil. You know, next thing you know, you're bringing a demon home with you or it's possessing you. That's happened. In fact, when they were filming this, the spirits were apparently angry. According to Tony Spiro, when he arrived with the camera crew, the spirits were upset and decided to shut off all the lights on them and to tell them this. We were starting to film, you mean, just as Rob was coming to us to start the interview, every single light went out. Every single light went out without any kind of jolting, just died. That was a warning to get out of here. Isn't that creepy? Like the way that Ed says that is so terrifying. Like the demons want you gone, leave. And in our final spot today, we have Beelzebub. What I'm about to show you is an unseen exorcism that was filmed by Ed and Lorraine Warren. In the video, we see Tony and Lorraine Warren performing an exorcism on a man named Roberto. This is the power, Jesus Christ. Okay, you hear me? Jesus Christ has all the power, you have none. What is your name? So in the video, as you just saw, they're trying to find out the demon's name so that they can then expel it out of his body. And you're not gonna believe what demon is actually inside of him. What is your name? Jesus Christ commands you to answer that question. What is your what name? What is your name? Beelzebub. Beelzebub? Is that what you're saying? Beelzebub? He's possessed by none other than Beelzebub. In Christian texts, the name Beelzebub is often associated with the devil himself. They would alternate between using this name and Satan. He is considered one of the seven princes of hell, and he is associated with the sin of gluttony. In other texts, he is described as the lieutenant of hell, second in power, to Satan. The thing is, he wasn't just possessed by Beelzebub, but a number of other demons as well. What other entities inside you? God is commanding you. In the name of Jesus Christ. What is it? Abaddon. Abaddon. Okay, who else? Who else is within you? The video went on and they found that at least four demons were inside of him. They then decided to ask the demons why they were possessing Roberto, like why him? And they replied with, for power. Why are you in Roberto? Why are you there with Roberto? Oh, that is absolutely creepy. I hate that. So crazy. 